Hello everyone, today we talk about ships and sailors in the low medieval uh, Mediterranean. Um, it's a topic that definitely we have to discuss uh, in depth, not just in this video. I think I made something uh, already about uh, something more, uh, relatively more, um, let's say, um, political, I mean focusing on the rise of certain particular maritime republics. This is going to be um, a general uh, topic. We will obviously talk uh, about certain um, political entities of the Mediterranean now, but the um, uh, the um, speech will be relatively uh, general to, to the world scene in this sense. Um, so mm, the uh, the whole idea of the low medieval Mediterranean seaman um, ship is uh, something attached unavoidably to what certain historians have called, even if I don't like it as a concept, the so-called uh, commercial revolution. Like the revolution. Every time you find revolution written anywhere, be cautious or at least try to to understand what it practically would be supposed to mean because um, let's be honest in in the Middle Ages th there were no revolutions of sort I mean there were definitely lots of changes but they were very progressive um, they, they took very long and the so-called commercial revolution is generally a, a much broader more complex and complicated um, ensemble of economical, social, uh, technological mm, developments um, that um, in, in some way mm, began to, to, to mm, let's say, even to reduce the importance of, rec of agriculture in, in, um, in European economy uh, during uh, the, the low Middle Ages. Uh, recently, just to, to actually counter this this idea you know that there is this sort of s of stereotype that at a certain point the low middle ages is the moment of the rise of uh, trade and uh, we forget about um, agricultural production that uh, however we're still uh, the backbone of every other economical activity and that actually triggered these um, uh, international trades including the uh, um, the sea ones, actually much of these trades involved um, agricultural exports. Mm -hmm. So I made recently a, a video about, uh, which is called Countryside and Cities in the Economical Revival of, the, of Medieval Europe, so if you want to go look at that, I try to explain how the vast majority of the economical mm, of, of production in low medieval Europe was still, and obviously as in other, any other pre-industrial society, based on uh, agriculture. Um, but there is no doubt that definitely um, trade, um, um, craftsmanship, um, manufacturers, um, the new instruments of exchange and of financing um, grew in the uh, centuries of the low Middle Ages to, to a very high um, level of dynamism. Uh, and that definitely uh, permeated the whole um, European economical system. Mm -hmm. So obviously the city is the um, place where um, these changes happen with the greatest, um, with the greatest uh, impact on society, on politics. Um, <coughs> and um, um, at, at the same time, um, um, the um, the city um, develops develops both because and uh, and develops in turn these uh, traits. Um, so it's uh, you know kind of the Marxian and um, Weberian struggles that goes on. You know who had more impact, the structure or the ideas. Um, it, it was definitely a. We're not going to answer, obviously, but um, just to make you understand how these developments were actually very interconnected, so that when you go to to explain it, you you have to take in mind that there were 
many factors that really intervened that history might have gone in a different way. Even if there were very strong and evident structural reasons for um, trade to develop, uh, certain mm, cultures uh, of, of this period, you see, they mm, they partly developed as well, others, uh, however, lagged be um, behind, like the the Arab world at this time was that had mm, that had been on the lead in the previous centuries for arguably any aspect of civilization, but um, among this uh, the cities and the development as trade centers actually started to lag behind. I mean, the European cities um, um, awakened after the, the the 11th century, after um, like half of a millennium of uh, sort of um, of sleep, <laughs> or at least of um, uh, of uh, half sleep, we can say, uh, began to actually display um, a much greater potential and, and a much greater dynamism than um, than the uh, than the Muslim centers. Um, so this is, um, um, you know, the, to in order to explain this. Mm, this phenomenon, we, we can't just say, you know, it was a climatic um, change, um, like a, um, a, a warming that led to the um, demographic explosion to the centuries following the 10th. The um, so there is much more to say, and, 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 and much of these causes actually lay in the um, the the nature of the European uh, social tissue itself, and they're very complex to explain. Now we, we don't have the time to do that. But um, let's say that the major changes occurred during the 11th and the 12th centuries um, uh, in this, let's say, uh, starting up. Uh, the um, the uh, it, it was about really um, new economical and social dynamics like a different repartition of property and of work, so a different form of of life organization. However, the um, center into which um, um, these processes ar ar arrive at the full development is, is definitely 13th century. That is an extraordinary century in medieval history. It's paradoxically both the century of, max of um, maximum development of feudalism as uh, of uh, uh, arguably as uh, uh, f for urban, uh, urban development. It is obvious that in the later Middle Ages there were certain urban centers that became um, even more, you know, more developed in a certain sense, but even from a sheer demographical point of view before the Black Death, um, we can say that Europe was definitely very different and, and, and a very, and a very, and a great giant comparison, especially the, in comparison, especially from a demographical point of view to, to later cities in the Middle Ages. Uh, this was due to, to the epidemics, but um, it was also a different social organization because the rise of these cities between the 11th and 13th century and the 14th century had been um, <coughs> some, uh, something extremely fast um, and uh, it hadn't been framed into a um, you know a hierarchy like instead it would occur later uh, in, in later Middle Ages and into the modern age. It was something much more um, um uh you know um more dynamic more effervescent uh if you want um and and and, and relatively uncontrolled um, um this as we said started from uh cities but it is also important to say that not all medieval urban centers were alike, there were huge differences between European cities uh, at this time, and, um, and, and, the and, and, and urbanism and its development in low medieval Europe is, is a very uh, important indicator to, to see what local <coughs> society wa was really about. Mm -hmm. So there were certain, certain, uh, certain um, 
certain uh, centers, uh, urban centers in, in Europe that were extremely developed, others that were, uh, this during the 13th century, others that were basically um, being born just at that time. So um, it's useless to to repeat once again that Italy and Flanders were the most advanced uh, regions in Europe. Um, there were other regions like southern France, even parts of Spain, the Rhine Valley, um, um, that were that saw a substantial rise of, of, of uh, urban centers. Also northern Germany saw these maritime cities uh, on the Baltic and the North Sea. Um, most, I'll say that the rest of Europe was most not an extremely developed uh, urban um, uh, area. Um, uh, and, and this had not, not just to do with how, you know, certain regions were Romanized, because uh, <coughs> if you take, uh, I mean, most of arguably was due to that, but it, it could have not been possible if during the Middle Ages there hadn't been a revival for other dynamics of international trade, of, um, of land organization and all that, however, we uh, have discussed in, in, in our videos. Um, we're not going to repeat them. Um, and there is, in this sense, another very um, obvious factor, that is that the, uh, the the greatest development of urban centers occurred on those um, great um, communi uh, communication um, um, uh, way, highways, we can say, even in certain um, from a, cer a certain point of view, that were either terrestrial or, 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 or fluvial, but definitely the ones who saw the, the greatest rise was the one uh, were in the, in the cities in, uh, dwelling on the coasts of the Mediterranean, especially, because because of many reasons that also here are not just geographical, uh, some of them enjoyed certain um, a certain degree of political autonomy that was either granted by right or it was de facto there, um, and um, that uh, could work as a sort of pole of attraction for the uh, landed aristocracy uh, in order to make it urbanized and therefore to bring into the city new capitals that could be used into the uh, um, urban uh, activities, chiefly the, the trade ones. So the um, there were also other big political factors like um, Muslim piracy that had been extremely intense between the eighth and the tenth century um, was um, was declining. Um, for also here for different reasons, because certain maritime republics, especially in Italy, had taken directly arms against them and were progressively pushing them um, uh, away um, from their their coasts, uh, but also because of the Crusades that, in this sense, could have not occurred if um, there hadn't been a uh, even a maritime, new mari um, revival in maritime um, uh, um, business and affairs. Uh, so the Crusaders, in turn, uh, were um, um, strongly uh, uh, damaging the uh, Muslim uh, um, piracy and its uh, trade activities. Um, <coughs> we have to remember, however, that Christians and Muslims uh, kept trading uh, uninterruptedly uh, all over the Middle Ages. It was never a time to which, uh, you know, since the war someone was waging war, that there was no trade between Christians and Muslims. That is something that never occurred. Um, because money are money, and <laughs> it doesn't matter what religion you have. Uh, and this is valid also for many other um, uh, activities and um, and um, the um, and this definitely contributed to this from mainland Europe the um, the com let's say the decumulation of um, goods the ex of um, agricultural surplus um, 
because by the way the, uh, even piracy had been negative not just on blocking the sea trade but also in damaging with warfare even parts of the uh, European mainland just recently I made a video on the Saracens so you can go look in medieval Islam playlist yeah, I we if you want to know more about that maybe that's surely the right video um, so uh, and uh, the um, the availability of agricultural uh, surplus made feasible, obviously, also the uh, uh, the exportation of uh, of them and the importation, the imports of of other of other goods from from the east, uh, mostly precious uh, textiles, spices, so all things that. All goods that uh, are showing, by the way, not just um, that are there are sometimes even lux luxury goods. So it, it, it proves that the feudal and urban elites in Europe were mm, uh, increasingly uh, wealthier, uh, materially speaking, and could afford to buy products that were um, uh, increasingly more. Mm, more costly and refined. Um, um, so let's finally get to the these maritime cities, to these maritime powers, and and, and observe their uh, their seamanship um, uh, and mm, let's say maritime vocation in general as political and social entities. So um, the let's say that um, the the presence of certain mm, maritime uh, centers into Europe. It's something that actually starts since the high, but even the early Middle Ages. Mm. If you take Venice and Amalfi, for instance, uh, you understand that uh, these were very advanced centers since an early age. Um, this began, uh, interestingly, uh, in Italy because of the um, control of the let's say, the, the control that the Byzantines, f at least formally, um, exercised on such uh, centers. Venice and Amalfi were formally part of the Byzantine domains, in spite of their mm, uh, increasing uh, political autonomy. Um, and so were other centers, uh, especially in southern Italy, that had remained um, uh, uh, and had dwelled within this uh, as city-states in in this sort of Byzantine Commonwealth, Venice uh, exploding. Um, actually, the southern Italy was much more advanced in, in terms of, of urban centers and maritime um, business for, for obvious reasons, I'd say, because historically speaking, those were more urbanized areas than uh, the Cisalpine Gaul. Um, they, uh, they were closer to Constantinople, so they could mm, interact more uh, easily with it. Um, there, there is also certain mm, climatic reasons, possibly, but these are uh, maybe more arguable. But um, it's definitely their geographical position in the middle of the Mediterranean that really <coughs> played it. Um, uh, yet Venice, that is in the north of Italy, uh, definitely exploited uh, its um, extraordinary uh, mm, uh, location between the lagoons. So it was a center that... There were other centers in the lagoons, like Comacchio, for instance, that was a, a fierce rival of, <coughs> of Venice, but that had developed earlier. This is interesting about maritime republics, because you understand that the canonic ones that eventually rose to immense power to, during the low Middle Ages, um, sometimes had mm, previous rivals that had developed before them. So that Venice had Comacchio, for instance, and Venice grew to be one one uh, European superpower at the point, um, uh, at least in, in novel terms, uh, in economical terms. Um, uh, Amalfi, that uh, is actually remembered as the first um, maritime republic as such, because differently from Venice, it was objectively already a, a city, while Venice was actually a group of communities dwelling on the lagoons that eventually joined to build up the city. But Amalfi belonged in this sense to a <coughs> to a greater uh, municipal 
uh, let's say an older and more continuate municipal tradition that had survived, uh, as we were saying, into the um, let's say uh, Byzantine orbit from since the ancient times, ideally. Um, and eventually, it was uh, it, it was also one of the first to decline. Hmm? One of the reasons for this was, uh, as we've seen, all the reasons that. Uh, um, we've mentioned, but the decline of the southern Italian maritime republics occur, occurred during the Norman conquest. The Normans were um, feudal, um, had a feudal system that was exported into southern Italy, um, and this feudal system practically choked the uh, urban development. Actually, the Normans kept um, a um, uh, they favored certain mm, certain cities in terms of civic mm, um, autonomies. Uh, if you take Bari, for instance, in Apulia, or um, Messina in Sicily, Naples, um, these cities were important for the um, for the Norman sovereigns because they didn't want them to grow too powerful and therefore to manage to to um, to play, you know. Uh, with other powers, uh, the attrition of uh, the Norman, um, the Norman um, kingdom to trying to to loosen the the, the Norman grip o over their over their communities, um, but at the same time were important trade centers as well. So they could be taxed, they could um, produce um, ships, as we will be seeing. So certain cities kept uh, a substantial importance. Bari was especially uh, rich because it. Um, it was a coastal city on the Adriatic, and therefore open to the uh, the east. But mostly, it was uh, basically catalyzing and exporting all the um, agricultural production of Apulia. It was one of the most fertile lands in Europe, uh, um, and uh, Messina was uh, of evidence, evident importance, being placed on the straits between Sicily and, and Italy. Uh, it was a very important crusader port, so there was a lot of, also of, uh, of people who came there and paid the, the, the Normans for, for passing, essentially. Uh, this is also how Italy made money during Crusades. Um, uh, Naples was, um, let's say, had remained, say, even s during the early Middle Ages, a very important city center. Um, and it increased in importance, especially um, during the Normans, but, but mostly during the uh, the Angevin era, because uh, the Angevins, differently from the Normans and the Swabians, shifted their the capital from from Palermo in Sicily to uh, to Naples. In this sense, it, it's interesting how you see that Palermo, for instance, was, was an important trade center, but it wasn't. Uh, it's never remembered as as a maritime republic because socially and um, I mean, even geographically speaking, it was something relatively different. It had been an important trade center during uh, Arab Sicily, but not under the Normans, while Naples maintained its kind of uh, entrepreneurial character. Also, because by the way, the Ro uh, the, the Normans ruled with an iron fist in Sicily, while in, in southern Italy they kind of... Um, I mean, it wasn't so easy to eventually control all the uh, uh, of the communities there, and sometimes in order to keep them at bay they had to grant them certain, certain privileges that um, allowed these centers partly to keep on with their autonomous um, trade uh, policies. Um, however, the baronial rule of Norman feudalism will end up to choke these very promising southern um, Italian uh, cities that that um, uh, wouldn't make them wouldn't make it to be a political mm, to to form political marit uh, to to form maritime empires like I don't know Pisa or Genoa or or Venice. So. In in this sense, passing to to the Tyrrhenian cities uh, um, of Genoa and Pisa that were formerly um, subjects to the uh, Kingdom of Italy, but that, mm, uh, as we know, were relatively free because uh, 
the, the Italian kingdom practically never saw uh, uh, a continuity in, in in royal power, and especially from the 11th century, um, it, it saw more than else the rise of of, of city states and not of a central um, uh, royal power. So Genoa and Pisa were, uh, first of all, fir fierce uh, rivals. I think I talked about uh, Genoa and Pisa and their rivalry. Um, in if you look into should be to medieval Italy playlist. Yeah, it, it should be Genoese maritime expansion during the 13th, 14th centuries, which which is a bit later to what to our times now but um i discussed um their origins so so if you and, and its relation with uh, with pisa so if you want to 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 listen to that it can be surely helpful to know more and um they began to to develop enormously um the tyrrhenian mm, maritime republics had obviously a Western Mediterranean oriented interest. Um, Genoa and Pisa essentially expanded to Corsica, Sardinia, uh, taking them mm, practically from, from Saracens, uh, contributing to the uh, Iberian Reconquista with their ships and freeing certain um, Spanish islands and, and coastal centers and raiding definitely into North Africa, but they also uh, had their own traffics in, in definitely into Syria and Palestine. Um, Venice instead was all about the, the Byzantine Empire and um, it had maintained in a certain sense this kind of lo love and hate relationship with <laughs> with Constantinople that by the way um, from the 12th century on onwards basically had only uh, Venetian ships because the uh, the 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 Imperial Navy was growing to cost uh, to cost a freaking lot, so it was easier for you know, to ask the Italians for ships every once in a while instead than building them on their own. Um, so um, so you understand very complex and articulated relations. Um, and definitely during this period there is the rise of um, other um, ports into the Western Mediterranean, chiefly Provencal and Catalan. Um, take Marseille in southern France or Barcelona in, 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 um, in Catalonia. Um, um, that uh, were developed, let's say, um, in a very complex relation uh, with the um the the ancient urban aristocracy but even with the the relatively um new uh new one of um low feudal uh, origin that had um that had um basically uh um moved into the cities uh, from 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 a relatively short time uh chiefly because the cities were this um um even the the the, the feudal traditional feudal uh, economy that was uh, rural uh, based essentially was in this sense suffering in uh, in uh, of the competition of urban uh markets so uh, sometimes, uh, rather than going uh, ruined, these um, rural feudal lords would uh, essentially mm, wouldn't really abandon their uh, rural estates, but would um, enter into the cities and start mm, making business uh, actually across the the city and the uh, and the countryside, which is very important as f f uh, as we were saying before, because it actually proves that the development of urban centers was uh, was definitely the consequence of a broader um, um, agricultural mm, development in Europe at this time. Um, it was growing uh, in increasingly intertwined with one of the cities. So the um, and the main activities of this um, urban uh, this mm, um, maritime, let's say. Um, cities uh, aristocracies were mercantile 
and uh, ship building or ship harming um, ship arming our, um, activities. So it was really about trade and um, and war at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Saracens were doing piracy, but piracy uh, <laughs> was done also by the Christians in that sense, and there is no no difference in that sense because um, religion is a good excuse to uh, to go raiding uh, an enemy um, an enemy port, uh, let's say as the uh, the the Europeans did on the coasts of North Africa when they got the upper hand into Mediterranean. Uh, at the same time, as as, we, as we've seen, they traded as well uh, with the Muslims. Um, it was uh, uh, um, let's say both things. It was essentially a mm, moment of peace with trade and a moment of war with uh, raiding the enemy convoys in practice. So uh, in, in into the maritime cities there was also specialization in, in, in shipbuilding that contemplated j this, let's say, um, um, let's say trade and, and, and uh, military, uh, economical and military specialization of, of the uh, of the of the ships uh, and um, uh, the uh, the were often the same way. I'll say that, uh, um, but we will talk about later uh, about the differences between between the various types of ships that were actually often very uh, very small. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the um, and and in in the coastal cities there was uh, also a uh, the experimentation of new uh, ways of making uh, affairs, practically. Um, there was uh, uh, a new tendency to uh, join into companies or com commander, as they were called, uh, um, more frequently uh, societates in, in Latin, so, so, so societies, companies, in, uh, um, uh, which consisted in mm, basically uh, putting your own part of, of, of capital um, together with other people um, to accept certain uh, the, the risks that um, uh, this uh, uh, um, this implied um, um, so there was also great development of uh, insurances uh, at this time of credit and activities for for this very reason, um, and and obviously the the intention of making of, of earning, um, uh, um, hopefully a lot. Um, the great trades um, happened as we have seen uh, working um, into the. Uh, to the maritime routes most of the time. So there was um, obviously need of ships and of sailors. And and this is the, re the reason why the, the maritime cities um, so the uh, the very uh, fast rise of, of shipyards um, and of people mm, that were mm, either the workers, the, the, the ship masters, the people who, who built up the the um, the boats and of sailors. Mm. It could be sometimes even people coming from mainland <laughs> that had never seen the sea. This was done also in times of emergency when there was a need, I don't know, for war to arm certain ships and there were no, not enough sailors um, and were because maybe they had been wiped out by a sea battle or stuff like that. So they, they took people coming from, I don't know, from the mountains. We, we didn't know. Uh, much, but that could be used as, say, aurors, for instance, or even as mm, as marines, uh, because mm, there is also very um, strict connection between mm, the development of sea and uh, of let's say of naval and terrestrial warfare at this time. Think about the crossbow. That so uh, its development first into the maritime cities and then. Um, I mean, not really into the minor same cities, but I into into sea warfare. Then um, it, it it was progressively more widespread into 
own land, let's say. So there is a very interesting indicator relatively to the um, to development of sea trades that is the um, the um, Crusaders routes uh, that were taken uh, for reaching the Holy Land. Um, if you look at the first three crusades, uh, first of all, the first cru crusade, all the crusaders had uh, traveled uh, by uh, by land, mm -hmm. um, with the exception of the Gen uh, of the peasants and Genoese that uh, had arrived in, in a second mm, in a secondary moment to consolidate their own conquests when the crusades uh, were seizing essentially the. Um, the various uh, near eastern cities uh, from from land. During the Second Crusades, uh, Crusade, um, the um, ships had been used only when the Byzantines or, or the Normans of Sicily had provided them uh, to to the Crusaders. Um, the third expedition uh, into the Holy Land is said was programmed as. Um, as a land route um, through a land route uh, um, a land route through the uh, the German lands, mm -hmm. so essentially passing through the Rhine Valley, um, the Danube. This had been granted by Frederick Barbarossa, who joined the Crusade for dying even before arriving, and therefore going down to the Danube and the Byzantine Empire, and from there uh, to the Near East. Uh, however, it should be noted that the English and the French uh, took the sea on that occasion. During the Second Crusade, there was an Atlantic route as well that incidentally brought also to the, um, if I'm not wrong, to the conquest of Lisbona into, um, into Portugal, uh, thanks to the help of the Crusaders. Um, that I is a famous episode of the Reconquista. Uh, in forties uh, during the Second Crusade um, of the eleventh century uh, of the twelfth century, and the um, however, f what you see is that from the thirteenth century onwards, um, nobody uh, that there were other Crusades, um, also larger than the previous ones in terms of sheer numbers. Um, then they they had no success, but uh, they were still pretty amazing feats, logistically speaking. I mean, at that time, nobody believed that it could that they could reach Constantinople by land, via land, essentially. Um, first of all, because um, terrestrial routes were much more risky and um, and too long. Mm. I mean, even before it was so, but uh, evidently th this is why mm, the maritime development is so important because now evidently there were new means, new ways, chiefly uh, uh, via a ship that were much more uh, convenient. Um, um, you can, you know, if you try, if you travel by sea, you can make a shipwreck, and it is dangerous, but it's never as dangerous as it can be a. a, a <laughs> uh, uh, a land route during the 13th century with brigands, with local hostile populations, with um, huge logistical cost, costs, by the way, uh, because which to be a ship you can use the, the wind energy, uh, there is much less attrition, uh, it, it's a physical convenience that pretty evident, um, and it, it's also and obviously much faster. So y y this proves that by the 13th century the ship has be become a, a completely normal and usual mean of communication of traveling. Mm -hmm. um, the um, in, in this sense, uh, even the, those extremely proud representatives of feudal and, and, and warrior aristocracy had basically um, put aside their uh, natural uh, aversion towards uh, the sea, and uh, and especially the the commoners that armed uh, these ships, and decided that it was the uh, the most useful thing to do to to travel uh, like that, and to move like that. This 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 is also important in from from a perspective uh, from a let's say ideological perspective as well in the changing of Europe, the opening of 
um, uh, of New Horizons, mm, uh, the Age of Explorations became became um, started uh, just the century uh, after. So it, it's really an, a really a new mm, um, a new way of looking at the world, literally. Um, so uh, the um, this was uh, definitely a, a big change uh, into European history, with uh, chiefly economical and um, and social uh, basis. Uh, technologically speaking, um, there wasn't I mean wasn't such a huge advancement at this point. Maybe just the dimensions of the ships um, um, triggered some some. Um, uh, um, technological improvement, but that wasn't really the the triggering factor. Mm. Uh, technology basically adapts to the needs of economics, and uh, economics and society it doesn't um, pop out from nowhere and is just applied. And yeah, we 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 have new uh, we have uh, the the world that changes. It's a world that makes technology change, which is, which is a definitely a very fascinating. Uh, dynamics. Um, um, so even if uh, ships were increasingly more mobile and and um, and easy to maneuver and um, and were used uh, in increasingly effective ways, because it wasn't uh, just like in land uh, warfare. It wasn't just about the individual ship, the individual elements that made the difference. It was also uh, this time there was an experimentation also in the in you see tactics into certain um, um, sailing uh, formations um, for you know increasing uh, security even from enemy attacks or shipwrecks and all um, and uh, yet um, as we uh, we said it was not a great technological advancement nor a substantial um, modification into the uh, types of ships that were essentially meeting the uh, usual um, traditional sailing uh, um, um, you know ways uh, that existed in, into the Mediterranean since uh, since ancient times substantially um, this was obvious I mean it's not that the, the Mediterranean in this sense was backwards in, in our affairs definitely uh, the Mediterranean was a much more advanced uh, area this time in medieval history than than the North ones. In the in the North Seas, in, in spe uh, the especially in the Atlantic Sea, because the Baltic is relatively milder for certain. Uh, there the were definitely there was definitely the improvement of different type of ships, but also in there it wasn't something um, uh, that you can attribute to new technological changes. Th there were essentially um, knowledge and um, know-how that was were put into practice because there were new resources to to, uh, to enact that essentially, but not because there, there were in, mm, you know mm, such a huge uh, progress and position and you know in 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 the modern mindset th there are sometimes this prejudices with um, that cannot take into consideration uh, a development without thinking about a technological progress. Uh, the greatest illusion of modern people is that it's technology that moves the world. Why, as we've seen uh, said, uh, it's the other way around. Um, so the the Mediterranean at this time was um, well before the ships. Let's talk about the Mediterranean in how it is as as a sea because practically it's um um it, it generally ha it has a mild climate not always um uh and especially it has an irregular regime of winds so uh, at the time actually um if you look at uh, i mean with modern animations from the satellite uh pictures and all you can see that that the winds into uh, to many areas of the world but I looked at especially at the Mediterranean are imagine the Mediterranean um, uh, 
practically filled with all um, small circles of wind that uh, always um, go in the same direction, in the same sense, uh, depending on the currents in certain times of the years. Um, at the time, the guys didn't have satellite <laughs> um, animations, but they perfectly knew that arrived at a certain point in into uh, uh, they they maps were being developed um, at this time. Cartography made a huge advancement at this time, thanks to the Mediterranean, uh, chiefly the Italians and the Aragonese, um, um, and uh, that's where modern cartography actually stems from. But they didn't have such a spatial, it, it was at least only at that time they were caring about having a spatial um, uh, overview of, of the, uh, the Mediterranean, cartographically speaking. Um, but they already knew since ancient times and arrived at that point of the coast there were certain winds that, that went in a certain way. So through that it was possible to say, to, to know, let's say in various times of the years, for instance where to go, how to go there, um, and especially to know, and this was very important also for naval warfare, where, when um, enemy ships could pass usually at that time of the year uh, through that uh, strait for instance so that it was impossible or very um, let's say it, it, it was very difficult to to know where a ship would pass I mean it was not the technology that uh, arrives in, into um, the, the 19th century that allowed basically to stop uh, uh, an enemy fleet on the base of your own uh, of the strength of your own um, but there could definitely be a, and, and you couldn't control the wall sea, but you you could um, foresee with a certain with a good degree of of certainty that um, certain uh, convoys would pass through that mm, place um, by that place uh, at that time of the year. Mm. Um, so. There was actually very um, material and practical know-how that surely sailors in, in, in already uh, still have. Um, but these were people who traveled much uh, quicker than, than modern sailors with much um, a smaller, or at least uh, much less safe um, uh, ships and that did this back and forth literally for, for all their lives sometimes. Uh, we know this from from, merca from merchants' accounts that these people were basically all their lives at sea, and they came home just um, for very few times, and then they were all um, about business and going back and forth uh, from from England to to Syria to to Portugal to to the Black Sea. So it w it was really a um, uh, a roller a roller coaster, really. Um, and and they had necessarily to have uh, certain skills that today have gone lost, if anything, for the loss of, of practice. Um, uh, so the Mediterranean has um, uh, it's also characterized by the, uh, the many islands that exist, especially in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, in the west, there are certain major islands, and then not not so much. Think that uh, at this time uh, the, these ships were um, doing essentially just uh, coastal navigation, mm. so they didn't venture much. So when you arrive into the Aegean Sea in Greece, you understand that basically, if there is a, a good visibility, uh, there is not a single moment into which you you can't see land because there is always some island here and there. Um, so this had historically triggered the rise of of of, uh, of seamanship in historically speaking it's, it's not a surprise that i don't know the greeks were good sailors in the, since ancient times because that that is a uh, you know it, there's always the stimulus if you see a land at the distance you you say I, I can't go there i can arrive there and and when you arrive there you see another island that is even beyond you say i want to go there too so this is how the human mind basically uh, and it's curiosity to think about the Odyssey and and um, and Ulysses, um, you know, uh, lust for 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 knowledge essentially, and um, and this is really a, a 
that was a really beautiful metaphor for explaining the the uh, the life that the sea um, develops develops in, in practice and the Mediterranean had always been uh, so um, so the um, uh, you you can um, the Mediterranean and th this is this is very important also logistically speaking because uh, if you uh, you can uh, land um, to to rest and to take um, water and food supplies um, frequently mm? so it, m it it makes it much easier to 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 sail in 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 the first place to travel in the first place and up to the 14th century, uh, the Mediterranean ships were essentially of two types. The first one was the um, uh, the um, lighter and um, um, let's say um, a um, elongated uh, um, um, or a galley mm -hmm. that. Um, that hosted a, a few sailors and, and passengers, but however uh, needed um, usually bet between 150 to 150 oars. Um, it was a fast ship, mm. however the oars had to practically um, um, stop every day uh, so uh, there was the need of a safe port to to stop every day because they had the orders had to rest. Um, the orders, by the way, at this time were all salaried. Mm, they weren't slaves. And slavery is something that happens um, a bit later. Um, usually, if you take at least the Italian uh, ships, you see that orders were actually pretty well fed. They were all salaried. They were freemen. So it was a uh, it was a job like another, and uh, evidently uh, something so precious to be um, paid so so well. Um, uh, so not like in movies where you see the guy that that is um, that is whipping <laughs> this the slaves with all the scars on their back. No, they were actually it was a tough life. I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not saying it it was anything easy or nice, but um, people made a living of this. If you think of all the ships that that, that traveled at, at this time, um, all the galleys that existed in Mediterranean, you can't even understand at a demographical level how many Europeans <laughs> were involved into uh, oaring. Um, there was then a second type that it, that was so called the so-called uh, round uh, ship that was uh, it had a uh, it was a tall ship essentially with a uh, with a mm, large hold, um, one, uh, only one sail, and definitely uh, apt for being acting as a cargo ship. Um, this doesn't mean that it was extremely different from the uh, conceptually from the other ships in the sense that um, it was definitely more versed for the transport of cumbersome uh, uh, goods. Um, uh, it didn't require actually a lot of personnel to be maneuvered, nor of frequent um, uh, frequent stops along the, co the coast. But it, it was um, it was slower, mm. it was uh, less uh, maneuverable, and uh, it was also relatively uh, more difficult to defend. Um, both the fast uh, galley and this round ship were um, were, however used um, at war in practice. I mean this differentiation was pretty I mean we, now we we, we, we we define two categories but there were lots of ships that didn't fit into this. By the way we don't really know um, extremely much about these ships either. Um, so there were really many types, many hybrids as well. Uh, every ship was something on its own at this time, obviously, um, and there wasn't really a ship that was conceived for military affairs and another one for um, for um, civilian use. They were more or less versed in for for both things. They could serve 
for bo in both ways. And they, uh, however, grew increasingly differentiated for essentially for the um, uh, the expansion of traffic and the increasing specialization that the D's needed. I mean, in terms of um, the, the major changes started occurring from from the 14th century, but we're not gonna talk about them now. Um, to to these two fundamental types and and all the um, other uh, variants. Uh, there were also other types of ships that were used um, for, uh, they were called ho something like hushers, and they were uh, used for the transport of war horses. Mm -hmm. um, this actually tells you how uh, armies also traveled, uh, how much they traveled by, by sea. Um, so war horses have all special um, logistical needs, um they uh, these overshirts were essentially um characterized by um certain big doors on the um side walls of the ship to that could be opened in order to make the uh, the horses entering and exiting and um they were um pitched very strongly tarred uh, to uh, to make them impermeable during navigation because uh, and the um, so as you can understand the uh, the shipbuilding uh, really uh, requested also lots of of material uh, sometimes we see that um, the um, uh, the um, you know, we say, oh, well, this guy is here in this city had th these ships, it's fine. But the ship had a huge cost. Uh, it's something that you uh, um, you don't just um, build and it goes. You have to keep it in shape, um, um, fit for, for sailing. Um, um, it's something extremely uh, costly. Um, think about the uh, the planking, the peach, uh, the uh, uh, all the um, all the hemp for the hosers, um, the um, the canvas for for the sails. I mean, it's all and 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 much more. You know, fortunately, we are we're very well documented about this uh, material side because we have lots of documents that are actually commissions for buying, for arming the ships. So I it's very fascinating. These are mostly Italian documents, at least the early ones there. Um, because these were the centers, uh, these maritime centers were the places in Europe where people were more versed into writing, into accounting. I so th there was th there is a, a huge documentary production that you find nowhere else in Europe at least in the same measure and the um and, and we're actually pretty well informed by all the, ne the the smallest components of these ships that had to be uh bought and uh and supplied um and even stocked because um these were mm, pieces that definitely uh uh the um 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 that went uh uh very um that they went wearing essentially in use uh, by using them and, and and they had to be substituted frequently so um think of at how many um specialized um craftsmanship was needed and how much wealth was needed for those time standards to, to put up these fleets. Um, by the way, uh, the 13th century is that um, uh, is a moment w that sees the the, gra uh, the great ra raise of of ships um, of fleets also for military use. Ah, I made a video. This is interesting about Castilian fleet in the 13th, 14th centuries. That actually talks about the early rise of the Castilian fleet. Um, and that uh, it might be interesting if you are interested how you know these first um, uh, military fleets were mounted by 
uh, a great um, uh, Iberian power like Castile in order to fight the, the Muslims in that case, but also for participating eventually in the 14th century to, to the Hundred Years' War. Um, but there was nothing like a permanent fleet. Like, especially the major feudal powers like Castile or, or France or England, they, they did definitely use ships uh, frequently for military use, but it wasn't continuous, it, it wasn't a continuous use. I mean, um, these powers hired ships, usually from, from Italian navies, by the way, um, um, for that specific military operation, then they uh, they disbanded them because they uh, they were too expensive. Um, there weren't still the um, say the uh, the material structures like in the modern age with a centralized government that could invest a certain amount of money, and that had the infrastructures for for building large permanent ships. But if you look at the Italian maritime republics, especially, uh, you understand that already from the, the 11th to 12th century, basically, there were permanent fleets there. They weren't permanent because there was a state that issued them um, to be maintained, but simply because trade activity was so intense that, <laughs> basically, um, the ports of the cities were f always full with galleys. And s some of these belonged um, to the uh, to the local families. Like if you take Genoa, there was never a a central uh, government that had its own ships. Practically, they were all private um, um, private owners that had sometimes several galleys, several tens of galleys. So this tells you, by the way. Uh, well, several tents maybe not at this time, but it could happen that someone could feel in times of needs and uh, could pay for, for galleys. So essentially a, a single Genoese aristocrat sometimes had more galleys than the king of, of, of somewhere. Um, in Venice there was something more articulated. Um, uh, Venice went faster towards a centralized, let's say, uh, government. Um, but I mean, the ships were always there. So basically, in times of in time of war, this, the this republic, so the, their central government said, um, I mean, the few central governments that existed said, okay, we need ships for war. Uh, so you, you, and you give us uh, our, um, not even give us, but just field, uh, just um, um, keep those ships ready for war and and send it to to that expedition. And and this was all one together with the political gaming and the private interests, because the guys in the uh, in the communal government were the same guys that owned the ships. So <laughs> this kind of makes sense. Um, so uh, the 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 number of galleys that these uh, maritime republics could um, provide was uh, really one of the best um, indicators of their material wealth. A huge wealth. If you take Venice, Genoa, these these were cities that, individually speaking, were uh, among the richest in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was normal that, that such things could happen, and especially as we've seen, uh, as we have seen, let's say that galleys could be um, used both as uh, for civilian and military use. So in time of war, it was enough to harm to arm a uh, certain galley with, uh, I don't know, with, with a good crew of cr uh, crossbowmen, men at arms and all, and to go to war with that, because it was essentially the same thing. And the galley, although with several changes, basically, however, remained as the, uh, uh, until the, the, the average uh, um, hmm, uh, ship, even warship, during up to the 18th century, mm, until the ship ships of the line, because it was perfectly suited for for um, Mediterranean waters. Um, uh, in, in at the beginning of 17th century, the Russians um, e mm, essentially uh, copied uh, certain galleys from the Mediterranean models and used them proficiently also in um, in the Baltic Sea against the Swedes on the Swedish coast, and the Swedes had all uh, had been in the 16th century, the first um, power to build um, actually ships that were 
um, conceived um, uh, from an engineering point of view for for a for a military use for lodging cannons, as for up to that point, as we've seen, was essentially civilian ships that were armed for military use, and and yet the Swedes suffered, uh, you know, defeats because especially when there, there was a uh, when the water was not deep, um, close to the coast, the, the galley was perfectly uh, maneuverable as the um, the, uh, the Swedish ships uh, with the um, deeper uh, uh, with the deeper uh, um, keel uh, would have got stuck into the uh, in, into the um, into the sea bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's um, it's very interesting how uh, the galley's technology actually survived for, for for millennia at this point because it is something that existed since the ancient times. So uh, it was perfectly um, suited for even for certain modern naval warfare uh, contexts. Um, so relatively to this uh, material wealth, even think about. Um, coming back on land for uh, for a while. Um, first of all, uh, how a trade was important, because not, not everything uh, for shipbuilding was uh, present, uh, maybe uh, around the maritime city inland, uh, or maybe it was simply more convenient to, to buy it from other city, uh, maritime cities, that, that maybe had them instead, or that it was cheaper at least, because that's the only I'd say that, that that's the first um, uh, the first concern actually um, to buy, and um, and think also about the deforestation that is implied. I mean, these ships, uh, all the wood that was needed for building them, definitely all at the time there was a lot of deforestation. Um, so there was a very strong circle of inter in the, uh, interdependence between the shipyard urbanism. Uh, trade development, also with the uh, inland uh, economy. Think about Pisa, for instance, was one of the most important maritime republics in Europe, and yet it was also partly a, a land power, mm -hmm. which is something rare because usually these maritime city states didn't really care about um, mainland control. Um, but there were also these hybrids, so you can understand in that case how even um, you know, the control of land resources was important, even Venice at a point for, you know, during the 15th century though, because of the Visconti expansionism uh, 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 and of the Sforza uh, needed uh, to, to conquer vast areas of northern Italy to ensure a um, uh, shield from, from this. And, and this implied, however, also the control of because the, the 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 main aim was to to safeguard the city's trades, so it's paradoxical that in that case the land expansionism was subordinated to the the um, the preservation of a trade empire of, of a naval empire that cared traditionally only about holding this or that port and had absolutely no interest in in, in controlling um, land, if not islands. Let's say that. However, had chiefly that um, naval uh, strategic uh, significance. So um, this all implied, but but the way the first station implied also the population of uh, forest at areas because um, you don't think about that often. But in order to deforestate, you have someone to that li that has to live close to a, to a vote. Mm -hmm. You don't just send guys from nowhere to cut woods without uh, something much more convenient to build settlements in there. Mm. Uh, and once you deforested an area, you could um, you could uh, eventually work uh, work the land in there. So this in turn triggered uh, uh, land clearance uh, and uh, further expansion of agriculturalism. Uh, this happened also for our activities. If you, you know, part of the, if you, especially if you say, if you see Northern Europe, how the Germans expanded into the East, uh, you know, 
they deforested also partly for building literally their own uh, towns out of the woods that they cut down partly uh, or maybe to export it so it's all a complex of factors that eventually uh, fueled this uh, economical revival of the low middle ages so I think I, I, I stop here for today and I hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive for if you're interested about receiving further news about my contents and uh, for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye